Shalom Chavrim. Uh, I'm Stephen Ben Dunoon. You're watching Dunoon Institute of Biblical Research. And today's message is going to be exposing Adam, or who is Adam? And I owe a great deal of gratitude to my good friend, Laurie Cardo Zamor, who we had an interview here together on going deeper into the subject. And I've, I've had so many people that have investigated this as well. John Costick also, who we did a video together talking about Edom. And, um, and Lori, I applaud her effort as well. I know she began to look deeper into this because of a video I'd done about uh, the Vatican and Edom. And uh, it concerned her because of the work that she's trying to do on anti-Semitism and trying to get the Vatican to acknowledge anti-Semitism. Uh, so, I really felt compelled to go deeper into this subject, and um, and so I did a, a lot of a lot of research. Uh, a lot of research I'm, I'm already aware of, but I decided to put the research together. So I've spent the last two days compiling this information together, and then trying to put it in an order that would be best uh, to make sense to you guys. So I'm, I ask you just to. Pray for us as we, as we uh, present this evidence here for you. This is only a drop in the bucket of the evidence that I have. Um, and I just trust that for my sister Laurie that it will also be a blessing to her. I know it's very difficult. Uh, her family, uh, she comes from a Jewish background. We will be airing the, the interview I did with her. Um, she did make the bold stand when she called Edom and she basically put that... Uh, the, the, the silence of the pulpits and the Protestant churches uh, at charge for not coming to Israel's aid during the Holocaust. Um, but I want you to see who God puts it, whose charge God puts this at. And yes, uh, she mentions Martin Luther, and that is very true. Uh, we talked about Hitler and, um, and how she spoke that Hitler was a, a very much a fan of Martin Luther, and this is very true. A lot of people are not aware of, though, that Hitler was actually Catholic. Uh, he was a very devout Catholic, and I know there's a lot that will argue against that. The, the Catholic Church has tried to distance themselves from Hitler since he lost the war. And, um, but we're going to go into all of that uh, tonight, and it's a lengthy teaching, and so I just trust that, uh, that you can bear with this. If you're not able to hear it all at one time, come back to it. Uh, just mark your spot where you left off at. I don't know how long it's going to be. I've got 20 pages of notes, 20 pages typewritten notes. So uh, a lot of notes. <clears throat> I want to first take you, if you have your Bible, let's turn to Genesis chapter 25. This is the birth of uh, Esau and Jacob. And I want to start here because I think it's very um, important to start here. This is also where the Lord began to deal with me about uh, the events that are happening in the Middle East, and, and we're just going to take and go from there all the way through history, biblically and historically, and put things in the right perspective and re reveal who Adam really is. You're going to learn a lot more than just Adam, though. That's what's going to be really interesting. God has revealed so much to me regarding this. All right, Genesis chapter 25, verse 21. Now, if I make a mistake in there, please forgive me as far as the the book and where, because uh, in some cases there I'd forgot to add it, and I went back trying to remember which ones were which. So, uh, so if I do make that uh, mistake, uh, forgive me. I, I did try to go back and, and do them rightly. I was copying and pasting the the scriptures. In some cases, I forgot to put the the book that it's in. Uh, it says here, and Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord was entreated of him. And Rebecca, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled together within her, and she said, it, If it be so, why am I thus? In other words, why is this happening to, the, to me? Why, uh, here God has blessed me to have two children, or to have children, and now there's a, a struggle in my womb. And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb. He doesn't call them children. He says, Two nations are in thy womb. And two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Interesting, isn't it? Now, that's actually prophetic in more ways than one. 
Okay? Keep that in mind. The elder shall serve the younger. It's not something Esau liked very well either, and neither his descendants after him. Okay, and when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau uh, because of that. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel. Keep that in mind. And his name was called Jacob, and Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. So fascinating, this story here, because... When John Kerry began the negotiations, the United States began the negotiations with Israel for a two-state, quote, two-state solution back, uh, um, gosh, it's been about a year, a little over a year ago, the whole world's eyes were transfixed on Israel. And oddly enough, as John Kerry put it, this nine-month negotiations. Now, then there was no two states, or at least, at least it seemed to be that there was no two states. And at first, when I even began to look at this, I thought it would be the Palestinians and, and, um, and Israel, the two states. This is what it would be. But then the Lord revealed to me that I was wrong in the way I was looking at that. He showed me that it was the Vatican. It's Esau and Jacob, and the Palestinians are not Esau. It's the Vatican. And so God began to deal with me and reveal to me these things and showing me that what's going on behind the scenes, we kept seeing, and this is what was kind of ironic, we kept seeing these different dignitaries, including John Kerry. He went to the Vatican. Um, Barack Obama goes to the Vatican. And not near as much as Mahmoud Abbas, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, and all kinds of world leaders kept going to the Vatican for meetings. And the Vatican began to seem to negotiate in behind the scenes the entire time. Well, this is what was kind of funny. We're looking at the Palestinians getting a state, and yet, as I've mentioned to you in many videos before, in Daniel chapter 11, it speaks about that prince that is to come, and he comes up strong with a small people. <laughs> Interesting, isn't it? comes up strong with the small people. Well, that's the Palestinians. That's who Daniel comes up strong with. He comes up strong, uh, or not Daniel, but the prince that shall come, comes up strong with the small people. I was just going to quickly turn to that as well, um, just to kind of uh, give you a little background on that. You know, and I've got tons of scriptures I have to go through with you guys, a lot of reading documents, evidence, and stuff. Um, but, and speaking of the prince who shall come, let me just first clarify that because some, some of you guys that are going to see this video, because I, I really have a strong feeling, if this doesn't go viral, it's going to be watched tens of thousands of times because this idea of the Antichrist, people have got so scrupled up. And, and now I, and I guarantee you, when you find out tonight what the Lord has revealed to my heart, you'll understand why. Now I know why they don't want you to know who. The Antichrist is they don't want you to look at the Vatican as being the Antichrist. That has been an intentional issue to hide it from the people's eyes because if you really knew who it was, you would forsake everything the Vatican has to offer. And all you Protestants wouldn't be joining back up with her either. So I do agree with Sister Lori when it comes to Edom being the uh, Protestant churches as well. Everyone that joins back up to the mother, yes, you are Edom as well. Uh, you just have to remember your birth from that great whore as John spoke about it. Daniel chapter 9, uh, he says here, um, this is where the 70 weeks are determined upon the people, and after 62 weeks shall an anointed one be cut off. That is Mashiach in Hebrew. He shall be cut off. See, that was Yeshua. He would be cut off, and uh, none will be left to him. And the people of a prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now that's a prince that shall come. And that prince that comes in the future is going to be of or a descendant of the people that destroyed the city and the sanctuary, which is a Roman. Also, he's an Edomite. Hmm. Interesting. We're going to look at all the historical data to prove that. Uh, so... It's a prince that shall come, and it doesn't call him a Mashiach at all. In fact, it mentions this twice, this other prince in Daniel. In both places, it calls him Mashiach, but not this prince that shall come. He's not regarded as Mashiach. Um, 
So anyway, moving along, and it's also, this is the time when, when Israel's sins come to an end. So, so many beautiful things happen. Um, another interesting point here, it says in Daniel 11, uh, but he shall come in without difficulty and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And the force of the flood shall he be swept away before him, and he and shall be broken, even the prince of the covenant. After the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully, for he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. There's your Palestinians. There, who's the one that's coming up strong with them? Who are the true backers of the Palestinians? It's the Vatican. The Pope is their champion. Shimon Peres says the only one that can make peace between the Jews and the Palestinians is the Pope, Pope Francis. And yet, <laughs> he uses the Palestinians. You know, you know, Palestinian people, you're an Arabic people, and you have just as much right to find Yeshua to be your own Savior, Jesus, for those that don't know what I'm saying, he wants to save you just like he would any other Gentile. That blood was shed for both Jew and Gentile alike. Why would you allow the Vatican to use you as a puppet? It's, it's a shame. It's a disgrace that this has happened to you guys. That you actually believe it is even worse. All right, so let's, let's move on here. So this, this is how we see that the story of Esau begins here. And like I said, John Kerry starts a nine-month negotiation. Um, now, here's one of the ones that I thought I had actually marked where this is at, but I did not. And I believe, let me just read the scripture for you here. And, um, and maybe I'll remember where this is at. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Mount Seir, prophesy against it, and say unto it, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O Mount Seir, I am against thee, and I will stretch out mine hand against thee, and I will make thee most desolate. I will lay thy cities waste, thou shalt be desolate, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord, because thou hast had a perpetual hatred, and hast shed the blood of the children of Israel. Oh, no, this is from Ezekiel chapter 35 is where I'm reading this from here. Uh, I believe that's right. Hatred shed the blood of the children of Israel by force of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time that their iniquity had an end. Now, how did Israel's iniquity have an end? When Yeshua gave his life for them. Actually, I take that back. The blood of Christ has already been shed because I has had a perpetual hatred. That's a continual hatred for them, not, never ending. And has shed the blood of the children of Israel by force of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time of their, iniqui in the time of their iniquity had an end. In other words, right all the way up through the pogroms, through Hitler, through Stalin. You know, it's not just Hitler involved in this. The Vatican's hand is in the murder of Jews everywhere you look. Why? Because they're Edomites. The Vatican is Edom. They are the Edomites. They are Esau. They are Mount Seir. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will prepare thee unto blood, and blood shall pursue thee. Sith thou hast not hated blood, even blood shall pursue thee. Thus will I make Mount Seir most desolate and cut off from it with him that passeth out and him that returneth. Now he's talking about there. It's beautiful the way God lays this out. He's showing you how the dignitaries and the world leaders are constantly coming in and out of Rome. You see, that's what he says. Him that passes in and passes out. Verse 7, that is. And I will fill his mountains with slain men in thy hills and thy valleys and in thy rivers shall they fall that are slain with the sword. I will make the perpetual desolations in thy city shall not return and you shall know that I am the Lord. So there's going to come a time the Mount Seir is going to be a perpetual desolation. And believe me, He's not talking about Edom. When Edom was destroyed, King Saul warred against Edom. King uh, David warred against Edom. King David took them for servants. Now, the Bible does say they killed all the males except one child that escaped. That's what, this is what's interesting. A child, Hadad, Hadad escapes. 
This one Edomite escapes. You know, it's the reverse order. You know how God was, you know, excuse me, not God, but, but Satan has always tried to stop God's anointed. When Moses was born, Satan sent out that death uh, decree by Pharaoh and he killed all the children trying to wipe out the promised seed of God. When Yeshua was to be born, Caesar, Pharaoh, was out trying to kill that promised child. You wonder why they know these things about the promises. You forget the Edomites are Abraham's descendants. You ever wonder why Italians and Jews look a lot alike? Because they're Edomites. That's not to say that God cannot save a Gentile, even though he's Italian. I'm not saying that. I know he can. Sure he can. He said he's the father of many nations. He wanted Esau to do well. Esau, the, when he says, I have hated Esau and I have loved Jacob, he wasn't talking about the actual child Esau, nor the actual child Jacob in that regard. He's talking about the two nations because God said she had two nations in her womb. That's what God's talking about. I love Jacob. In other words, I love Israel. And I have hated Esau. Because he knew what Esau's descendants would become. They would grow this huge, massive Vatican that would hate Israel. See, it didn't end. Let's, let's continue on. Verse 9, I will make the per perpetual desolations. Thy city shall not return, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Because thou hast said, these two nations and these two countries shall be mine, and we will possess it, whereas the Lord was there. These two nations? These two countries? Hello. Somebody wake up. Two nations. They're trying to divide Israel. The Palestinians don't ever seem to get a state, but you know what? The Palestinians are giving the Vatican a state in Israel. Why do you think that when me and my wife and my father-in-law and my children, we sat in there and, and right in the Temple Institute and, and, the, and the spokesman said, we do not have control of Jerusalem. Who has control of Jerusalem then? It's Rome. It's Edom. Because thou hast said these two nations and these two countries shall be mine and we will possess it whereas the Lord was there. What does he mean the Lord was there? What is he talking about the two nations? That Lord right there in Hebrew is yod Hey vav Hey. That is God's divine name whereas God was there and God came down. God was there in the Holy of Holies. The Chodeshim, the Chodesh, the Chodeshim. That's where God was. That's how you know what it's talking about. It's talking about Jerusalem and they're wanting to divide it and make it into two nations. It's nothing unusual. Rome, what did they do? They took Italy and they divided it and made a little tiny little, little postage stamp place over there, a nation. It's the wealthiest nation in the world at that. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord, I will even do according to thine anger and according to thine envy, which thou hast used out of thy hatred against them, and I will make myself known among them when I have judged thee. Wow. God will make himself known un among them, the Jews, when he has judged thee. When he's judged Rome. Now, <laughs> Oh, God help me. See, we're going to do rabbit trails. Besides my uh, notes, we're going to do rabbit trails. Revelation 11. In Revelation 11, it speaks about the two witnesses coming. And when the two witnesses are actually killed, it says in verse 8, And their dead bodies shall lie on the street, the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people of the kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another at the death of the two witnesses. Now there's another scripture, and I was actually trying to look it up here for you. We had to put a little pause in the video here, but I'll, I'll try to put it, because I couldn't find it, but I've, I've said it in many videos already, quoted it already, that God actually, He delivers Israel 
when the world rejoices. And, and it even says right here, and I will make myself known among them when I have judged thee. And when does he judge, when, or excuse me, as I, I'm sorry, not, he judges them at the time that the world rejoices. And, I, and I'll, try to, I'll try to put that scripture up for you so you can see that there. Uh, I wish I had made that part of my notes there, but I, there's so many things that, I, that I'm going into here and that I did not intend to go into in all these things. But anyway, let's continue on. We're, again, we're looking at Ezekiel 35 right now. And uh, the 12th verse, And thou shalt know that I am the Lord, and that I have heard all thy blasphemies which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying, They are laid desolate, they are given us to consume. Isn't that interesting? Laid desolate, given us to, to consume. It makes me wonder, under Jacob's trouble, what will we go through? What will Israel really go through? Will it be a situation where we're brought to such a an attack from the worlds around us Will this give the Vatican an, an, an edge to really get the covenant struck between the two? I'm not, I'm not sure. And I can't say that we're not already in that covenant already. We may very well be. I mean, who knows? God, God all alone knows. Now we're into page two of the note. Genesis uh, uh, 36 uh, is where uh, Esau went. Um, uh, this, I just want to bring this out here. This is just historically. We can go to Genesis chapter 36. This is where it says in uh, verse 8, Thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Esau is Edom. And these are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in Mount Seir. That's just establishing the, the genealogical place that Esau actually goes to and, and dwells there. Because I just got to reading you through Ezekiel 35, and God is talking about destroying actually destroying uh, Mount Seir and, and, and puts it in a, in, in prophetically in the hour we're living at today. That's why I say the Bible actually reveals to you who Mount Seir is, who Edom is, who the Edomites are, or Edomea, as they say in the Greek language, I believe it is. All right, let's go to Numbers chapter 20. Moses requests to cross Edom to reach the promised land, and Esau refuses that. Here they are, the brother to the, to the Israelites. And, you know, it's funny. Jacob never really had that much trouble with Esau himself, though he feared that he would. It's just like when, when God dealt with Ahab, and Ahab repented before the Lord, crying out. And God says, I will not bring it upon him, but I'll bring it upon his son after him. And as I've told you many times before, I believe Shimon Perez is that son, that descendant of, uh, of uh, the, the wicked king Ahab. All right, so let's go and let's look at this here. And Moses sent messengers from Kadesh unto the king of Edom, Thus saith thy brother Israel, Thou knowest all the travail that hath befallen us. It's the same thing with, with the Vatican today. They know all the things that Israel has gone through. How our fathers went down into Egypt, and we have dwelt in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians vexed us and our fathers. And when we cried unto the Lord, he heard our voice and sent an angel and hath brought us forth out of Egypt. And behold, we are in Kadesh in a city in the uttermost of thy border. Let us pass, I pray thee, through, the, through, the, through thy country, and we will pass through the fields or through the vineyards. Neither will we drink of the water of the wells. We will go by the king's highway. We will not turn to the right or to the left until we have passed by thy border. Now, he, Edom said unto him, Thou shalt not pass by me, lest I come up out against thee with the sword. And the children of Israel said unto him, We will go by the highway, and if I am my cattle drink of thy water, then I will pay for it. I will only, I will only without doing anything else, go through on my feet. And then Edom still refuses him. And finally sends out a huge band of, 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 of soldiers to dare him to come in, trying to get to the promised land. I mean, think of, think of the historical application here. There's no difference. All the evils that have happened to Israel and all they've done is wanted to go back to their homeland. And yet, Rome, controlling all the politics of the different countries around the world, have blocked Israel on every hand returning to their homeland. Mm. Of 
Going into verse 24. Aaron shall be gathered. Uh, this was interesting to me. And the Lord spake unto Moses, verse 23. Moses and Aaron and Mount Hor, because they had to, they had to turn back. They, they left Kadesh. They go back. They go to Mount Hor. And the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron and Mount Hor by the coast of the land of Adam, saying, Aaron shall be gathered unto his people. For he shall not enter the land which I have given unto the children of Israel, because you rebelled against my word at the water of Meribah. Now, I, I went ahead and included this in here because I thought it was interesting. Because God is untying, and, and believe me, it goes so deep. You, I, I'll spend months now going through this to, to, to show you the things the Lord is revealing here. But uh, I thought that was interesting that Aaron actually had rebelled against Moses at Meribah. You know, Meribah was when Israel first came out on the journey. They're about two weeks into the journey. They're thirsting to death. There's no water. And God was doing that only as a sign to show Israel that they will have to thirst for that water of life. And the water of life would come from that rock, and the rock would have to be smitten. Well, here's what's interesting. Aaron rebelled against Moses during that time. He was with the ones that said, because Moses said, they almost want to stone me. Uh, and and it's, it's interesting that, that Moses makes this comment like that. He said, Lord, they almost want to stone me. Aaron was part of that group. Do you not know that God was showing that the Levites, the Levitical priesthood, the Pharisees, would be against Yeshua when he come because the rock had to be smitten? God was showing it through the type of Aaron. No wonder why God requires Aaron also to make a bullock for a sin offering for him and his sons. That was because of what happened at, uh, when, at Mount Sinai. When Moses goes up to get the commandments of God and Aaron follows the people and make a golden calf. That's why God has him make a, a, a sin offering for him and his sons and everything using a bullock. To remind them of the evils they had done. But in this case here, he doesn't allow him to go into the promised land. Why? Because they rejected, you know, the, the big argument at Meribah was that whether or not God was among them or not. That's the same thing that happened 1,500 years later when Yeshua come on the earth. They, the big argument was whether or not God was among them or not. And the Levites rejected Yeshua as being Mashiach. And they took him out and they judged him. Just like God had commanded Moses at the rock, take the elders of Israel with you, go out there, smite the rock that it bring forth its waters. Now I know 38 years later he spoke to the rock, just so I don't want you guys to be confused about that. It's two different, two different accounts altogether. Um, but anyway, uh, that was another, I just want to bring that out because that happens also at the time when, when why? When, and the reason I say that, this is another reason why it's important. You have to understand Moses is trying to get Edom to allow them to pass, to get to the promised land. And it's the Edomites that refuse them to have passage. They're trying to get to the promised land. It's the same thing with Rome. Rome was there in Israel at the very time when the promised land had come in a human body called Yeshua. But this time, just as... Just as uh, Yes, it's, it's deep. Let's, let's, let's continue on. I don't want to get into too many sidetracks. We've got a lot of information to cover here. Uh, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 14 and verse 47. This is where King Saul fought against the Edomites. Now, this is Israel has become a nation at this point. We're kind of going through the history a little quickly here. And also in the 2 Samuel and chapter 8 is where you find that David um, ends up fighting against the Edomites. They kill all the males and they made servants of the Edomites. But as I said to you, there was one... Uh, that escapes, and that's Hadad. And I want to show you this, because it's very interesting, the escape that he does, and, and, and the words that are spoken here. In 1 Kings chapter 11, it says, And the Lord stirred up an adversary unto Solomon, Hadad, the, Ed the Edomite. He was of the king's seed in Edom. Royalty. See, it's been a royal bloodline. This is why the popes do the way they do. They're looking for royal bloodlines of the Edomites. For it came to pass when David was in Edom, and Joab, the captain of the host, was gone up to bury the slain after he had smitten every male in Edom. For six months did Joab remain there with all Israel until he had cut off every male in Edom. 
that Hadad fled he and certain Edomites of his father's servants with him to go into Egypt, Hadad being yet a little child. So even his father's servants that went with him, because he was a royal son, were also Edomites. They were descendants of Esau. So it's not just one child that makes up a whole new Edomite race. It was his servants as well who were Edomites. And they fled into Pharaoh. And they rose out of Midian and, and came to Paran, and they took men with them out of, out of Paran, and they came to Egypt unto Pharaoh, king of Egypt, which gave him an house and appointed him victuals and gave him land. Now, this is what Pharaoh does for, for this young man, Hadad. And Hadad found great favor in the sight of Pharaoh, so he gave him to wife the sister of his own wife, the sister of Tophanes, the queen. Imagine, you imagine what we can go with this here. And the sister of Tophanes bare him uh, Ginnaboth, his son, in whom Tophanes weaned in Pharaoh's house. And Ginnaboth was in Pharaoh's household among the sons of Pharaoh. You know, I mean, th the history of Esau is so reminiscent of the history of Israel. Just like with Moses. Moses is reared in Pharaoh's house. No wonder why they try to claim the same historical line and everything. No wonder why the, the Arabic people, the Muslims of today, are very, have a very similar uh, story of the Exodus story, but yet they believe that it ends up being the, uh, the Arabic people that become the promised children. Very interesting. So anyway, he, he goes down here in verse 22. Then Pharaoh said unto him, oh, I'm sorry, verse 21. And when Hadad heard in Egypt that David slept his fathers and that Joab, the captain of the host, was dead, Hadad said to Pharaoh, let me depart that I might go to mine own country. Interesting. He calls Israel his own country. He's not talking about Adam. He's waiting for David to be dead. And David's general, Joab, to be dead. Then Pharaoh said unto him, But what hast thou lacked with me, that, behold, thou seekest to go to thine own country? And he answered, Nothing. He didn't lack anything. Same thing with Rome today. Rome doesn't lack anything. Rome just wants Jerusalem for their own. They got everything. They got all the gold of the world. What more do they want? They got to have Jerusalem. And they won't be satisfied until they get it. Thou seekest to go to thine own country, and he answered nothing, howbeit let me go in any wise. And God stirred him up another adversary, Rezin, the son of Eladah, which fled from his lord Hadazar, king of Zodah, Zobah, excuse me, and he gathered men unto him and became captain over a band when David slew them of Zobah. And they went to Damascus and dwelt therein and reigned in Damascus. Now, that's something that's really important to understand. Hadad ends up in Damascus with this other, or this other band here. So they're, they're all connected together. Verse 25, And he was an adversary to Israel all the days of Solomon, beside the mischief that, that, that Hadad did, and he abhorred Israel and reigned over Syria. See, there's a tight connection between Rome and Syria as it is. Well, understandably, why? Now, um, I'll just keep these things in mind. We'll come back to the historical side of Hadad in a little bit. I'm going to show you the historical side of Hadad. Remember, Hadad is an Edomite. Okay. In 2 Kings chapter 3, I want you to look at this here. The, so the king of Israel went, and the king of Judah, and the king of Edom... And they fetched a compass, a seven days journey. And there was no water for the host for the cattle that followed them. And the king of Israel said, Alas, that the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. Because, you know, they're getting ready to do a, do a battle against the Moabites, And they want to wipe them off. This time the king of Edom is joined with them, with Judah and the house of Israel. It's kind of like, the Protestants, the Catholics, and the Jews of today in one way. Just, just a little thought there. I just kind of find it interesting. Because it makes you wonder who is really the house of Israel. And I don't want to get into that doctrine where people say, oh, it's all the Christians. I don't believe that. I believe a lot of these Christians are Edomites in the first place. 
But I do believe that among them are a lot of the children of, of the house of Israel too. So I think it's a mixed company here. So let's take a look at this. But Jehovah said, um, because, okay, I'm sorry, verse 10. And the king of Israel said, Alas, that the Lord called these three kings together to deliver them to the hand of Moab. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord, that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one, and, and one of the kings Israel's, of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. And Elisha said unto the king of Israel, What have I to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father and to the prophets of thy mother. And the king of Israel said unto him, Nay, for the Lord hath called thee these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. There may be a lot more to this than what I'm actually seeing myself, and I'm sure there is, because my heart just goes in all different kinds of directions when I read this. But let's, I want to stick with the main part here I want you to see. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regarded the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee, nor see thee. I want you to keep that in mind when you think about Israel today because Israel today is the house of Judah and Benjamin Netanyahu was anointed to be the prime minister or in this case here when you're anointed you're anointed to be king over Israel and I don't say that everything he does is right because I don't like the fact that he went to Rome in the first place but for the respect that God has allowed him to be the leader of Israel at this time may bear some value there but now bring me a minstrel. And it came to pass when the minstrel played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. For thus saith the Lord, Ye shall not see wind, neither shall ye see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water, that you may drink both ye and your cattle and your beast. And this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will deliver the Moabites also into your hand. And you shall smite every fenced city, every choice city, and shall fell every good tree, and stop all the wells of water, and mar every good piece of land with stones. I think there's a twofold meaning there, because certainly the Vatican has marred every good piece of land with building a bunch of cathedrals over places that are sacred and, and, and of godly places. And, and that's a, dis, that's a disgust, disgust that that's even happened. Anyway, though, as he goes on to say, um, For thus saith the Lord, you shall not see wind, neither see, you see the rain, yet that valley shall, okay, we already know that, that they would bring the water. Now here's what happens, though. After you talk about the stones, in verse 20 it says, And it came to pass in the morning when the meat offering was offered, that behold, there came water by the way of Edom, and the country was filled with water. You see, you have to understand, the scripture is we're beginning to put these things together. Everything is foreshadowing different, different events. When God had Moses come out and strike the rock, when God had Moses deliver the children of Israel, he said, The Lord thy God will raise up a prophet like unto me, which was Yeshua, no doubt. It was Jesus that was raised up. And then what does he do, though? When he comes out, Aaron, his brother, he rebels against Moses, Moses at Meribah and questions whether or not God is among them or not. And his own son, the Pharisees, the Levitical priest line later when Yeshua would come, which would be God manifested in a human body. They question whether or not God is among them or not. And you know what's funny? You, you might think that this is kind of nuts to say this, but let me tell you something. All the miracles that they were seeing, all the miracles the Red Sea parted, they just walked through the waters of the Red Sea on dry ground. They'd seen all the plagues that happened in, 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 in Egypt. And then they, because they get thirsty, the reason God made them to thirst is so that they would ask for Him. The reason you thirst is because God wants to come inside of you and make His abode in you. But instead of them thirsting for God and asking God themselves, Oh God, give us to drink. 
They want to kill Moses. They want to stone him. The same thing did the Levites, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. They wanted to stone Moses. Or, or, or Jesus in this case. Yeshua. And so did Adam. You know, it's kind of funny. The Adamites are here in the picture again. 1,500 years after the case with Moses, it was the children of Israel and Adam. And here, the Adamites, Hadad escapes. He goes into Egypt. Then he ends up in Syria. And you're going to find out a little bit. Goes up into Rome. Ends up in the northern parts of Africa. No wonder. And then comes back down again against Israel once again as Romans now. It's Adamites. And the Bible says that the water that would come forth and, and the prophet, he's actually prophesying of Yeshua coming. He's prophesying that Jesus would come and that there would come a water that won't come by wind nor rain, but it would be a water that will come by the way of Adam. In other words, the Adamites, the Romans, took and crucified Yeshua and that Roman soldier stuck the spear in his side, that Adamite, and brought forth that water separated from his body, which allowed the life of Yeshua to come out of him and come back upon the people to the Jews first. Now, I'm not, you have to understand, I'm not speaking in a negative way against people that love God. I've got good friends that believe this ministry, that support this ministry. Brother Austin in, in, in North Carolina, him and his family, they were devout Catholics. And he is Italian. But it shows that God can save anybody that's willing to yield themselves. He would have saved Esau had Esau been willing. But Esau was not. But it's that spirit of Edomite that refuses, that refuses God's way and wants his own way. So that water did come by the way of Edom later. 30, excuse me, it was 1,500 years later when the Edomites, the Romans, decided to crucify Yeshua. Oh, gosh. In Exodus 17, just to show you about this water. Verse 3, And the people thirsted there for water, and, for, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is that thou hast brought us up out of, out of Egypt to kill us and our children our cattle that thirst? See, the cattle again. Notice how that it was Jehoshaphat, the good man, the king of Judah. It was... Um, Oh gosh, who was that with him? Ahab, I, don't, I forget which one it was, but the king of Israel. And it was the king of Adam that come down together, all three of them. And their cattle were thirsting. They had no water for their cattle. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They almost are ready to stone me. Same thing with Yeshua. They wanted to stone him too. Hmm. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod wherewith thou smotest the river. Take in thy hand and go. And behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb and thou shalt smite the rock and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel and he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Couldn't believe. They couldn't believe with all the miracles that Yeshua was doing. He turned the water uh, to wine. He turns the, uh, you know, just like Moses turns the water to blood, red, red wine, you see, a type there. He takes, he, he, he takes a fish, feeds, what is it, 5,000 and, and three fish, five loaves of bread, feeds the multitudes, he raises the dead, heals the sick, all these miracles, and they still ask the question, is God among us or not? He was there to deliver you from the Adamites, but you refused. God also knew the other things would happen. That's why I read to you these other things already. It's interesting in Scripture that Adam revolts 
And so did Rome. And Yeshua did not destroy Israel, but forgave them for David's sake. That's something else I thought was very interesting. Uh, and that was only a type of Yeshua. God didn't destroy Israel because of Yeshua. Now, this uh, and there's another scripture I forgot to write down the, the place where it's at. Uh, it says, The Lord would not destroy Judah for David, his servant's sake, as he promised him to give him always a light to, the, to his children. And in his days, Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah and made a king over themselves. Mm. That, that's something that you really want to take a serious look at right there. And uh, I'll post it on the screen for you if I can remember what, what, chat, what book that's in. Uh, uh, I forgot about this. I want to, let me read this again to you. This is verse 19, and that is... Um, If you go to 2 Kings chapter 8, that's where this is at here. 2 Second, Second Kings chapter 8. And um, it says, Yet the Lord would not destroy Judah for David his servant's sake, as he promised him to give him always a light and to his children. In his days, Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah and made a king over themselves. Now, that's what I found very interesting. Edom revolts from under the hand of Judah and made a king over themselves. When did this happen? You see, notice verse 19. Yet the Lord would not destroy Judah for David's servant, David his servant's sake, as he promised him to give him always a light and to his children. So the thing is, is when Yeshua was crucified, when the Jews handed Jesus over to the Romans to be killed, he, he, he should have or could have wiped out the children, the house of Judah for what they did. But he doesn't do that. That's why we see in the story of David everywhere, 2 Samuel, you read about this, how David beautifully types out Yeshua in every aspect of his life. He weeps over Jerusalem. His son Absalom refusing to recognize that he was the anointed king of Israel. And he does a coup. He revolts against his father. Just like the Jews did against Yeshua. They revolted against him. And he could have put down the rebellion with his men. He had warriors for, for, for companions. But David said, don't do it. Let him alone. They went out. Saul's sons cursing him and condemning him. They were Benjamites, throwing stones at him, spitting on his men, spitting on David. They said, should this dog's head stay on his body? He said, let him alone. He said, the Lord told him to do it. That's because why? That's what they were going to do with Yeshua. David was typing everything out. He crosses the River Jordan. Yeshua crosses the River Jordan. And Yeshua said he will not come back until Israel says, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Baruch Haba Hubashem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And David refused to come back until Israel was in one heart, in one mind, in one accord. Then David would come back. Hmm. And so it was at that time As a type in his days, Edom revolted from under the hand of Judah and made a king over themselves. And so as a type, when Israel, they took and, 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 and they, the, the Romans besieged Jerusalem, sacked the city and burnt it with this Roman general Titus and made a king over them. They revolted from under the hand of Judah. Historically, we see that the Romans come in about 60 years before Yeshua comes on the scene. 
In Psalm 60, God has spoken in His holiness, I will rejoice, I will divide Shechem and mete out the valley of Sukkot. Gilead is mine and Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is in the strength of mine head. Judah is my lawgiver. Moab is my washpot. Over Adam will I cast out my shoe. Now that's a strange thing for God to say. But there's a reason why he says it. Fill us to triumph thou because of me. Who will bring me into the strong city? Who will lead me into Adam? Will not thou, o God, which has cast us off? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, whoa, wait a minute. What are you talking about? David in a psalm is prophesying that Israel has been cast off? This is Psalm 60. David is writing this. Israel is cast off. He's going to cast a shoe over Adam. He said, who will bring me into the strong city? Who will lead me into Adam? Will not thou, O God, which has cast off? And thou, O God, which didst not go out with our armies? Wow. Do you realize that he's talking about when Israel, when the Romans came against them, God did not come out? He fought with David. He fought for David his whole life. David could not be talking about his own time frame. Even when David, when God, he'd angered God by counting his people, one of the things that God said, should I let three days your enemy pursue you with the sword? And he didn't want that to happen. He allowed the plague instead to come. Killed 70,000 Israelis, Jewish people at that time. So God did not go out with them, which did not go out with our armies. That's when they were fighting the Edomites, the Romans. Give us help from trouble, for vain is the help of man. That's today. All these negotiations, Mr. Prime Minister, Netanyahu, my brother, Benjamin Netanyahu, you're not, for vain is the help of man. Man's not going to help you out of this situation. The world will turn against you. They have to. That's what the Bible says would happen. You know that. And, and, and you're dealing with Edomites. Do you not even realize who you're dealing with, my brother? I'm concerned, even as Laurie Cardoza Moore even says here, to, says here, many of the Protestants are Edomites. You have to remember, even Martin Luther was a Jesuit, a, well, a monk, basically the same thing as a Jesuit. He comes out of the Vatican. He starts the Reformation. There was some good that came out of the Reformation, but not because of Martin Luther. Martin Luther hated the Jews, totally against God's people. That's not of God. Through, through God, we shall do valiantly, for He it is that shall tread down our enemies. So we know that we're going to be delivered from the Edomites. We know we're going to be delivered from the Romans. In other words, that's also the reason why we see Rome in control of Israel once again. Remember the story of Boaz and Ruth. There's something I want you to think about when you're looking at this. I bring this up because he says, Moab is my washpot. This is God speaking here. Okay? Just, just so you know what he... See, it says, God has spoken in His holiness. I will rejoice. I will divide Shechem and mete out the valley of Sukkot. Gilead is mine. He goes on to say, then he says, Moab is my washpot. Over Edom will I cast out my shoe. It's the kinsman redeemer. Yeshua came and redeemed Israel. In Ruth chapter 4, it says this, now this was the manner in the former time in Israel concerning the redeeming, concerning changing, for to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor. And this was a testimony in Israel. You see, this unknown kinsman, he didn't want to mar his inheritance. So he would not redeem Ruth the Moabite. He didn't want to mar his inheritance, but he was a nearer kinsman. And Boaz, like Yeshua, 
he becomes the redeemer. But as a sign that was to be done, he had to pluck off his shoe and give it to him as a token. God takes off his shoe and throws it over Adam because Adam wanted to be the one that would redeem Israel. But God took it because they couldn't do it. Neither could that near kinsman that Boaz had to deal with. He could not redeem because he, he didn't have the ability to redeem Ruth. He didn't want to. Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee. So he drew off his shoe, and Boaz said unto